Now, delegates, this time last year when I spoke to you, we were facing the biggest attack, the biggest government attack on trade unions in a generation. They planned to slash union funding, to strip away our political voice and threaten the democratic right to strike. I think we can be proud of our campaign against this nasty, vindictive law. Yes, they got their Trade Union Act, and yes, it will be more red tape. It will be a waste of members' money, and it will be a waste of everyone's time. But Congress, let's be clear, we beat them. Not on everything, but in the big battles, we beat them back. And I'm grateful to those from all sides of the House and beyond who rallied to our aid. And I hope that the strength of uh, that support in the whole country will give the Conservative Party pause for thought. Because if they seriously believed that attacking workers' unions was the answer, then seriously, they were asking the wrong question. It's not over yet. We've still got our work cut out to win the democratic right for our members to vote online, to ward off any plans to use agency workers to break strikes, and to stop new state powers being used and abused. But what remains of this silly, spiteful law won't stop us defending members' jobs, it won't stop us speaking out, and it won't stop us fighting for fair pay. As always, when they try to hit us, we come back stronger. Now, throughout our campaign, we understood that success depends on unity. And we're going to need that same unity now because the referendum results on Britain's membership of the European Union heralds a whole new era of uncertainty for the working people we represent. The General Council had asked me to lead a campaign that talked about what was in the best interests of working people, about the rights that we enjoy, fought for by unions, but guaranteed by the EU, about the risks to our economy, and our public services, our precious NHS, and about what the single market means for jobs. The campaign wasn't easy. For me personally, facing Boris and Andrea Leadsom in the BBC debate was quite an experience, and not one I'd be in a hurry to repeat. Uh, but as someone told me, at least now I can say I've played Wembley, um, the, the campaign the campaign wasn't clean, or in my view, it wasn't even honest. Fake promises of more money for the NHS, dog whistle appeals to anti-immigrant sentiment, and the bizarre spectacle of a self-styled vanguard against the establishment, led by a former stockbroker, a serial backstabber, and a member of the Bullingdon Club. Well, many... While well, many set it out, we stepped up and we made sure our members knew what we thought. And in the end, uh, our poll showed that a major majority of trade unionists voted Remain. But for many, it wasn't an easy decision. And I respect those who thought differently, especially those in our movement who made the judgment that they thought was best, and those in the communities that we have long championed, who paid a high price for globalisation and are still paying the price of the crash. In this movement, we're Democrats. We accepted what the British people have said. So what I say now is, whether you voted, remain or leave, our job is to get the best possible deal for working people and to build a Britain that is successful, prosperous and fair. A Britain of great jobs for everyone. We face a new government and a new Prime Minister too. Now, as a rule, I'm all in favour of seeing more women in charge, but it's no secret that this isn't the one I would have chosen. 
Nevertheless, in three weeks' time, she'll be stood in a hall like this one, giving her big speech to an audience that's, well, a little different from this one. And woman to woman, I'm going to take the liberty of giving some advice about what I think she should say. After all, on the steps of Downing Street, the new Prime Minister admitted that life is much harder for working people than many people in Westminster realise. She promised us social justice. She vowed to govern for the many and not for the privileged few. So my advice to the Prime Minister is simple. Prove it. Show us that your top priority is to make sure that workers don't pay the price of Brexit. And before you pull the trigger on Article 50, we want some guarantees. EU citizens living and working in the UK must be given the right to remain. They are our friends. <laughs> They're our friends, our neighbours, our workmates. And frankly, delegates, it is plain immoral and inhuman to keep them in limbo. The public agrees with us guarantee their right to stay. Secondly, negotiating our exit can't be left to the Tories. This shouldn't be about managing the internal politics of the Conservative Party. It's about shaping the future of our whole country. We need a cross-party negotiating team, including the nations, London and the North, and it can't be a case of cosy chats with the CBI and the city either. As the voice of working people, trade unions must be at the table too. Third, before we go for Article 50, we need proof that workers' rights are safe. They weren't gifted by Brussels, but won by trade unionists. And people didn't vote leave to get rid of holiday pay, to lose time off to care for sick children, or to junk rights for temporary and agency workers. And our European neighbours won't give Britain good access to the single market if we end up becoming an offshore haven for cheap labour. So, Prime Minister, no ifs, no buts, guarantee workers' rights now and for the future. Now, of course, we all hear people, we've heard the mantra, we keep being told Brexit means Brexit. Now, I'm not sure that many union leaders would get away with saying a walkout means a walkout, a strike means a strike, and that's that. At some point, we would have to spell out what we want, what we think we can get, and win a mandate from our members to negotiate. The same goes for the Prime Minister. How can her government know what to negotiate if it doesn't know what the country thinks or what the rest of the EU would accept? Now, in some corners of Whitehall, there is talk about a new trade relationship between the UK and the European Union based on Canada and the CETA model. Well, let me give government fair warning. Britain didn't vote for new trade agreements that destroy jobs, set up secret courts and open the way to privatisation. If they go for the son of CETA, we will make opposition to TTIP look like a tea party. Instead, what we need is a proper plan for the economy. Just one week after the vote, the TUC published our National Action Plan to protect jobs, to protect investment, to make sure that ordinary people don't pay the price. Because let's be clear, they can't afford it. After all, workers in the UK have already suffered the biggest fall in wages since the crash of any developed economy except Greece. Now, you're not going to catch me talking down industry, and we know the importance of confidence. But delegates, 
We remember the recession after the financial crash, and we know all too well the risk of complacency too. And union reps across the country, conveners at our biggest workplaces, they are telling us about the worry that people are facing. Reports of investment plans stalled, job hires and apprentices on hold. That means that the government must be ready to step in and work to keep the advantages that we get from membership of the single market for all our industries, not just the city. And if Theresa May is serious about an industrial strategy, then we've got some ideas about how we build an economy that works for working people, that creates wealth and spreads it. Over the last few years, only two OECD countries had worse capital investment rates than the UK, and that was Greece and Iceland. We need immediate investment to sustain demand, to create new good jobs, and to show that Britain is open for business. That means delivering on that long promised program for home building, and making them affordable to working people on average wages. So let's have some more council homes too. It means a, a real commitment to high-speed rail. HS2 is ready to go. We've signed a framework agreement with them. That's great jobs on decent wages, unions on site right there. Let Britain's workers build us a 21st century railway. And it's make your mind up time on Heathrow too. A vital sign that we're looking outwards to the world. Now last week Heathrow announced their pledges to unions about pay, progression, training, safety and working with unions. The best way to ensure that every single one of those 180,000 jobs is a great job. And there's more. We need government support for a balanced energy policy, including nuclear, an ultra-fast broadband across the UK, a thriving creative industry, green tech that helps us meet our climate targets, and great new jobs too. This isn't a wish list, it's practical projects from a practical movement. So Theresa, tell us that you will go out there and find those sectors where the UK is off to a great start where we compete on quality, where R&D shows the way, where we can export the products of workers' hands and workers' brains, build the roads and the railroads, and yes, the airports that connect them to markets. That's how you'll create well-paid, high-skill jobs of the future. And one last thing, you can't build a strong economy without a strong NHS and strong public services too. The cuts have hurt so many communities so badly. It's time to start investing and make our people fit for the challenge of a post-Brexit world. So we have the best educated workforce in the world, fit and healthy, decently housed, in neighbourhoods that thrive. So hit, listen up, please, government. Pull an emergency break on austerity and end that public sector pay squeeze now. <laughs> and whatever else you do, make taxpayers' money work harder to support a British industrial strategy. Now, you said we're taking back control. Well, we're a better place to start than with the jobs of steel workers. You remember it was ministers who blamed the EU for the dumping of Chinese steel, when in fact we all know it was the Conservative government blocking the tariffs that Brussels wanted. So no more excuses. Put your money where your mouth is, take action now, and save our steel. So that's what I want the Prime Minister to think about as she writes her first party conference speech. And my offer is this, where we agree with your policy, we'll support it. If you want elections to put workers on boards, we'll welcome it. 
If you're serious about tackling greed at the top, we'll work with you. And if you're going to drive an industrial strategy that brings great jobs across the UK, we'll roll up our sleeves and help. Because I hope that the experience of the past year has taught the Tories a lesson, not to underestimate the trade union movement, to remember the breadth of our support and to give our ideas a fair hearing. Now, I've spoken today about the big challenges facing our movement, about the working people that we're here to represent. Brexit, which changes the whole game, the Trade Union Act, which we still need to oppose, and I'll add another, and this one is for us, and that's to win back all those people who would once have been union members, man and boy, woman and girl, in those towns where the big factories left, when they left, unions went with them. Now, some of them are still our members now. Many are not. Some politicians like to say that globalisation has left them behind. I'd put it stronger than that. They've been abandoned, ignored, shafted by corporations that shipped out overseas, by governments that cut local services to the bone, and by an economic philosophy that treats human beings as little more than a commodity. The simple dignity of a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, enough to raise a family on, to live in a place that deserves to be called a home, the security of a permanent contract and predictable hours, a bit over to put aside for Christmas, birthdays, holiday, a car, gone for too many in too many places. Now, we were right to ask our members to vote Remain, but frankly, it was a hard ask in communities where there is no prosperity to be shared, where power is in the hands of the zero hours boss, where self-employment is a sham, where people too often feel looked down on and sneered at. And this is important for people maybe outside of this hall. When our people talk about pressure on schools, about wages being undercut, about fear of change, that doesn't mean working class people are racist. And I want to take trade unionism back to those towns to show that we listen and we've learned, that we understand and we care, that the hopes of people in towns across the UK are our hopes, that we want what they want and win a better deal for communities where too many jobs are rubbish jobs done by decent people who work hard and deserve better. Men and women, Brits and Poles, black and white. And today, I want us to commit to another big cause, and that is to organise Britain's young workers, the new blood of the British labour force. Their life at work isn't great either. They need the benefits of being in a union just like any other worker. Now, our movement showed the spirit that inspires us in that Sports Direct campaign. After months and months and months of brilliant and patient Unite Union organising, sparking public outrage about the disgraceful practices at Shirebrook and solidarity in action, unions collectively using our shareholder power at that annual general meeting. And we got a result for retail staff and end to zero hours, no more six strikes and out, and at long last, the chance to get agency workers onto permanent contracts, a proper win for workers. <laughs> of course, it's not over yet. And Sports Direct may be in the spotlight now, but let's be clear, delegates, they are not the only ones. There are other big companies that bring shame on our country, so, delegates, I'm giving fair warning to any greedy business that treats its workers like animals. You're next. We're going to shine a light on you. If you, 
If you run a big brand with a dirty little secret, a warehouse where people don't even get paid the minimum wage, a fleet of couriers who are slaves to the app, let us put them on notice. We're on our way, delegates. We're coming for them. A hundred years ago, this movement campaigned to abolish piecework and day labour. We innovated, we organised and we won, and we will do it again. It might look different. We might organise on WhatsApp or Facebook. We might use the courts. We might persuade customers. We'll win over shareholders as well as recruiting workers. But there will be no hiding place. We will organise and we will win. And Britain's unions will not rest until every worker gets the fair treatment they deserve. Now, the watchword of our campaign plan is building back stronger. And that is what we must do building a union movement in touch with the everyday lives of working people, reflecting their concerns, talking their language, alongside them in their communities, in their workplaces, and yes, on digital too. After all, we are the original social movement, the UK's only democratic mass movement for change, the only one that puts ordinary working people first. And every shop steward knows it. However tough the challenge, you can't just walk away. You negotiate, you organise for great jobs, fair pay and strong rights, no matter who's in government, in or out of the EU, global and local. Our job is to win for working people. So let's get to it, delegates. I move. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Francis. And Congress, we now move to the vote on the General Council Statement and the TUC Campaign Plan. Will all those in favour please show? Thank you. And all those against? Unanimous. Thank you for that. And Congress, we now move to a really important special feature, reaching out to young workers, a key area of our campaigning work. been joined on the stage by a group of young workers. Each of them does a different job or comes from a different sector. They're unusual because unlike the majority of young workers, they are in a trade union. And each one of them has a story to tell about why. So welcome them all. delighted to invite four of them, four young workers, to share their stories of why they think all young workers need a trade union. Hello, my name is Sophie. I'm a waitress at the Dorchester Hotel and a member of the Unite London Hotel Workers Branch. <laughs> 
I think it's always important to be a member of a trade union at any age, but it's especially important for young workers, as we can often be the most exploited and easily disposable to employers. That's why it's so important to know the union has got your back. We've got to grow the trade union movement for the future. We all know that unionised workplaces have higher pay, better conditions and give you dignity in your job. But so many young workers don't know this. We are a very active sector-based branch. We work as a sector because many of our members work in non-unionised workplaces and will experience the same problems and injustice whoever their employer is. We recently ran a campaign around fair ticking with another branch, London Unite Restaurant Workers. Waiting staff often have their tips stolen by the company from payments made by card. We were sick and tired of hearing about the awful practices in the sector where it seems obvious to us what the policy should be. This time we focused on Pizza Express. We saved protests, we got media attention, signed up restaurant staff to the union, customers started to ask where their money was going. We got help from other unions and activists across the UK. Pizza Express dropped their so-called admin fee and many others changed their practices to avoid being targeted next. In May, the government published a new consultation document promoting fair and transparent tipping practices, but our campaign still goes on. This showed me how much power we have. It highlighted the real benefits of being in a trade union and how it makes serious positive changes in people's lives and is a force for good in society. I want to be involved in the movement and I want the movement to actively choose to involve young people like me. Thank you, conference. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sean. I'm 19, year old, 19 years old. I work as a care provider. I work with Graham Care, a company which runs homes across Surrey and Sussex. To be honest, I didn't know much about unions before I joined, but care work involves a lot of rules and regulations. So I knew it would be good to get some advice and help. The GMB union are active where I work and were encouraged to get involved because they helped out with legal stuff, contracts, health and safety and pensions. I've encouraged others to join because I know that if everything goes wrong at work, the union have our back. The membership is growing and I'm excited to be part of that. Some people say that unions are out of date or a thing of the past. A lot of people my age don't know about unions or don't get involved. But when it comes to getting on in work, being protective and moving up in your career, joining the union is one of the best things you can do. Hi, I'm Nicola, I'm a member of Equity. I'm primarily an actor musician, but also an event manager, an office temp, whatever pays the bills. For the entertainment sector, low and or even no pay is a huge issue. So at the beginning of last year, we launched a campaign called Professionally Made, Professionally Paid. We ran a survey that found many young workers were earning less than 5,000 pounds a year. As a result of the campaign, over 175 productions have signed up to our fringe contract, meaning over 800 performers and stage managers have been paid at least the national minimum wage. This has generated over a million pounds in wages since we started for people who may have not received anything before. <laughs> to support us, the Federation of Entertainment Unions have run courses in how to negotiate pay, how to deal with setbacks and other business skills. It's not the kind of training an employer will ever give you, especially being a freelancer, but it's exactly the sort of thing that a modern trade union can do to make sure its workers are treated properly. And it's been great for me too. I've got a lot more confident. I now no longer fear engaging with employers that refuse to pay the national minimum wage. And I've met a lot of other people in the same situation. We've stood together and I'm proud to say we've grown together. Thank you. Uh, my name's Chris, I'm a Unite Young member and I've been active on the Sports Direct campaign and what a campaign that was guys, Steve Turner has been absolutely fantastic and the support we've had from the Unite team has been unwavering. We looked at that campaign a year ago and we thought maybe we can't do this and we were thrown in at the deep end as young members and we have been pushed and supported so well by the Unite team and taken leading roles and gone in and organised. We've had national picket lines against um, the Sports Direct stores. We've organised social media and just not let up and pushed and pushed and pushed. And we're not stopping, we're getting them off zero hour contracts. We're pushing to now get into the workplace, organise the workers and keep going forward with getting that membership there. We're not just going to stop with Sports Direct, we're going to keep pushing forward. 
We're sick of just fighting back. We're now on the offensive. Um, as uh, Sophie, Sean, Nicola and Chris have highlighted, young workers need unions just as much as everyone else does. Trade unions were founded to give ordinary workers a voice, to stop exploitation, to win better treatment and fair wages. Union workplaces are still the safest, fairest and best paid. We represent everyone at work, but we know that just 11% of low, middle-earning, uh, 21 to 30-year-olds, that's about one in 10 of young people across the board, are in a union. And young workers are the group least likely to benefit from union membership. They deserve fair treatment at work, but their voices are missing from much of our movement. Usually they're in workplaces where there are no other union members, let alone a rep or a recognition deal. And sometimes the language of trade unionism is one they don't recognise or understand. And frankly, we haven't always made sure that what we talk about is relevant to young workers. In my view, there can be no more urgent task than to improve life at work for Britain's young workers. And we all know that the best way to do that is by getting organised uh, into unions that understand young workers' lives, geared up to win the changes they need, and are ready to meet that challenge. We've got to build on the great work that we've heard about today and change our movement so that we become the movement for young workers and led by young workers too. I don't think there's any higher priority. Building back stronger, building a movement for young workers winning a fair deal. That's what today is about. So I want you, delegates, if you will, to join us in taking a selfie using this banner as a backdrop, or I understand there are banners under your seats um, that you can use too. But let this be the start of the biggest organising one movement campaign that we've ever run, and make this the movement of young workers too. Thank you, delegates. Good luck with the selfies. self 